so um, just to, uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about a couple of these uh, as I go, but just to, just a sense, you know, some of these ideas that are out there. I actually heard a high school kid say this one time, this this exact thing. First one I just wrote down was Jesus probably didn't exist. Actually, this I think it was this year. Actually, I had a student say that, and I teach a video editing class, and he was just kind of going off about something, and I just kind of looked over at him like, why would somebody think that? And being a high school teacher, I'm not exactly allowed to, you know, just get into a big debate about that. But I just started to ask him questions about why he believed that. And then some of the other students in the class uh, just started chiming in. Well, how come we're A, D, and B, C if Jesus never existed? And they started to kind of draw on just some basic rational thoughts. But we'll get deeper into that. But that's an, that's an idea that's out there. Some people think Jesus wasn't even a real person, didn't exist. Um, not anyone who's a scholar, though. And... Um, then there's this idea I read, people changed the bad parts. So, oh yeah, they took the Bible and then they changed it to, to fit what they wanted. Okay, another idea that was out there. Much was added and removed by the Catholic Church. Oh yes, the evil Catholic Church. Um, I think maybe, I don't know for you guys, but like growing up, I don't know if it was the history teachers I had, but it was sort of this, oh, the Catholic Church, like this big, dark organization who who wanted to suppress people. And it, sometimes I think in history, the Catholic Church gets a pretty unfair uh, shake when it comes uh, to, the, to the history of, I don't know, Europe. And, uh, and, and so that same evil Catholic Church that some people have in their minds, yes, they changed and removed and added things from the Bible. So, so let's get into it. Uh, four reasons that these sort of, you know, uh, popular opinions that aren't supported by any scholars, uh, for reasons that we can say that they are not uh, accurate ideas. Okay, first one, uh, first class of evidence or class of logic here is it's written in, the do- in a documentary style. So I, uh, I might teach on the Old Testament uh, and the reliability of the Old Testament next week, but uh, the New Testament, let me just start from the beginning. So this is um, the New Testament right here. So if you take a Bible... Okay, uh, this thinner chunk uh, we call the New Testament was written uh, after the life of Jesus. Uh, somewhere, like some of the earliest uh, letters were, like Mark, it's estimated Mark may have been written 40 to 44 AD. And so Jesus died 33 AD. And, uh, and so you've got Mark, uh, maybe the earliest gospel, and then the latest book, uh, Bible scholars think John was in Revelation. Those two were written maybe around 90 AD. So John was a young man when Jesus was around, and so he lived to be a very old man. And so maybe the Gospel of John was written as late as 90. Um, and so, so first century, this is a first century collection of documents, historical documents, and then uh, the bigger chunk of the Bible is the Old Testament. So I'm going to focus my, my discussion today just on the New Testament. We've got the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that are the beginning of the New Testament. Those are the four eyewitness accounts of Jesus. And then you've got, right after the Gospels, you've got the book of Acts, which is a book that was written by the same guy who wrote Luke. Um, it was written by Luke. And um, it... Uh, it sort of goes through the beginning of the church. And so it's early Christian history, uh, like first 30 years of Christianity. And then you get into the letters. And a lot of the letters, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, a lot of the letters were written by a guy named Paul, uh, who is kind of the star of the book of Acts. And then you've got a few more people, um, Peter, James, uh, Let's see who else is in there. There's the book of Hebrews. It's unknown who wrote it. And so there's ideas out there about that. So uh, John is another author of some of those letters at the very end, you know, kind of here. Um, so, so I'm going to get into this now. Four reasons. If you were just a historian looking at the Bible, four reasons that you would say, yeah, this is a historical text that is reliable. First reason, it's written in a documentary style. So uh, an example of this we see in, so, so actually one of the people, another quote I have from Quora, that website I was on, is, is that the Bible was written by the Emperor Constantine when in around 330 AD. Uh, so 
let's take a look uh, at this, okay? Uh, so Luke chapter one, verses one through four, we see that the Bible was written, uh, and I mean, just reading the New Testament, you start to get a sense like, this thing seems to be authentic. And so just listen to this passage by Luke. This is how Luke starts uh, his gospel. He says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating um, among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an account, an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. And so Luke, um, from church history, the idea is that Luke was a, a physician, a doctor who traveled around with Paul. And he, I, I tend to think of Luke as like the guy in the New Testament who I can identify with the most because he's kind of like medically minded and he just likes evidence and he likes to investigate things. And so he's kind of this emotionless biology teacher like me, except probably much more educated than I was. Um, and the way he writes this is exactly how I would have done it if I was going to write a gospel. I would, I would go and I would carefully investigate everything and I would try to write an accurate account. And he's actually writing it for this guy, Theophilus. And, and you'll see in the book of Acts that, again, Acts starts with uh, Theophilus. And so, so Acts is sort of like Luke wrote Luke as like the life of Jesus. And then wrote, Luke wrote Acts to tell Theophilus after Jesus died, here's how things went for the first 25 years, okay? We see in Luke uh, chapter three, verses one and two, that once again, Luke has this very um, evidence-based, put it in real time and place kind of strategy in the way he writes. It was now the 15th year of the region of Tiberius, in the, or sorry, in the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea, Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Ituria and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. He said all those things just so he could say, at this time, a message came uh, from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. And so if you're just, if you're the emperor Constantine, which this is called a straw man. Nobody really believes this. So this is an easy argument to knock down. But if you're the emperor Constantine and you're going to write a book uh, about something that happened 300, 350 years earlier, you're going to have to do quite a bit of homework to come up with all these details about who was in charge of what areas and, 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 um, and it, you know, what regions they were and what their titles were. And as, as people investigate the Bible and the history of the Bible and then take it from other documents, uh, what is known about that time period from those documents, the Bible seems to fit really well. The New Testament seems to fit really well in the time period it's supposed to be written in. Um, here's another one. I remember reading this as a young Christian and just thinking, man, like this, this is like interesting how, you know, when, when you're like a little kid, like I was a little kid, I grew up in church and... Um, Sorry, I want to see what time it is so I don't babble for too long. What have been, 10 minutes? How long have I been going? Okay. So, um, so when I was a young Christian, like, I had no idea what the Bible was. Like, not a young Christian. When I was a kid and I went to church sometimes with my mom, I had no idea what the Bible was. I thought the Bible was just a book full of rules or something like that. The Ten Commandments and then, man, that's a whole lot of commandments that must fit into that thing. And then I started reading the New Testament first for myself and I, I remember I finished uh, Matthew and then I got to Mark and I realized, wait a minute, Mark is just like Matthew. So then I was like, so the Bible is just a bunch of reports of the life of Jesus. And then I found out, wait, there's other books in here. So there's only four of these eyewitness reports of the life of Jesus. And then there's this book of Acts and Romans, and there's these letters that were written by pastors to churches. And you start to read this thing for yourself and you realize like, wow, this seems to be like a collection of historical documents. And that's exactly what the New Testament is. And I remember reading Peter, must have been a lot later because I read through the New Testament. Peter's toward the end. 
when I was a young Christian, and, I, and he, he just says this. He says, for we were not, this is uh, 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18. For we were not making up clever stories when, you, when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now when you read a passage like that, where he literally says, these aren't made up stories. It's, it's fairly convincing, just if, as a regular person. You know, if somebody stands there and is talking to you and it's like, hey, let me tell you something that happened to me, and they tell you some crazy story, it's kind of believable just because they're the, the genuineness with which with they speak. And so, they, they're, you know, if you take away the supernatural stuff out of the Bible, there's no reason to even think like, oh, this, this seems fake. It seems like a real document when you read it. Um, even to somebody who's a, an atheist, minus the, they're not going to buy into the miraculous things. But, the, you know, it seems like a historical document. So that alone is a pretty good reason to think the Bible's a historical document. But that's not enough because there are... Um, forgeries of things. And it, there, were, there were actually other documents that you can date that they come later where they actually, because this was a thing, there were like the fake ones too. It's sort of like I got an email or we get a, occasionally at the school district, we get fake emails where they'll actually, I don't know who the people are that do this. They must, I don't know if they make very good money off this, but they'll, they'll go to like a school district website like Crook County High School and they'll go and they'll find out who the principal is and they'll get her name, and then they will send an email to all the staff at the school and say that it's from Mrs. Jonas, you know, my boss, Michelle Jonas, and, and it, they'll, they'll, it'll say something like, blah, 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 hey, I need you to check this link out, click this link, blah, 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 Michelle Jonas, and they'll send us this email, and it's totally fake, and it's just to get people to click on some link or something to download a virus. I don't know what, what the, pro, the, the, I don't know why somebody takes the time to do this, But there are forgeries out there, just like there's forgeries with emails today, and you'll get things in the mail you know are fake. It's the same thing, like, people actually eventually, after Christianity had taken off, they started writing fake uh, gospels. You can find the Gospel of Thomas that I think is, like, dated to, like, 200, uh, you know, or something. And so there are fake documents out there. And so um, although, you know, these gospels are written and appear to be historical, there, there needs to be more evidence on top of that uh, to show that. You know, another perfect example of this, and not that I love to pick on Mormons, but the Mormons are a really interesting case to study when you're looking at, well, how would you know if a document was fake? And like I said, I have no desire to like put down Mormons, but the Book of Mormon is a lot, it, I mean, it appears to be, and I haven't studied this enough to have a, a, an official position of how I think the thing was formed, but I do have enough, I think I've studied it enough to have a position that it doesn't at all seem to be a real historical document. And so it seems like Joseph Smith or maybe a couple other guys were really clever and they took a lot of time to make a fake document. Um, because the, the Book of Mormon is sort of written in this sort of uh, documentary style, like it, it's documenting these ancient Native Americans who were actually Jews who came over from Israel. And this is, this is a totally made up story that is, no historian believes is true except for Mormons. Um, but there's all kinds of names of places and even discussion of weapons made of metal and animals like horses being rode into battle. And if you take the Book of Mormon and then you take everything we know from history and archeology span and you know, there's no metal in North America uh, when the Book of Mormon is supposed to be happening. There's no horses in the, in the United States when the, the Book of Mormon stuff is supposed to be happening. And there's no evidence of any of these ge- geographic locations that they talk about. And so the Book of Mormon seems to be a perfect case of like somebody literally made up a fake story and tried to sell it to people. Um, and so we can look at the Bible and we can say, hey, is the Bible, is the New Testament like that? Is the New Testament like the Book of Mormon where somebody way later just created a fake document that didn't really represent the time period well at all? And the answer is no. And so we're going to get into a few more things. Besides the documentary style, now I'm going to move on to 
reliable transmission. And so here's, here's a couple things you can find about what people think about. People, people will pass around misinformation. And so one thing I found on Quora was one person, and this is a, this, I've totally heard this from people before. Did you ever do the experiment with friends or class or a class where the first person is given a story to tell and then it gets passed out? It seems, this seems like something I did in fifth grade when it was a rainy day and we couldn't go outside for recess. So my teacher had like one of us sit in a desk and then he told us a long story. Or t- I think he took, took us out in the hallway. I think I was the one out in the hallway getting this story. And I remember getting this whole story from him and I could not remember all the details he was telling me. And then I was supposed to go in and tell it to somebody. And so then I told it to the next kid, and then it, that kid whispers it to the next kid, and it slowly goes all the way around the room. And then the kid at the end has like a completely different, you know, he's like telling me about, you know, there was a guy who lived at this street and he ate this for breakfast. And then by the time it gets to this kid, it's about a lizard who lives in Hawaii. You know, and it's just completely uh, broken message. And so this person is suggesting, by the time it gets to the 10th retelling, is so embellished, and change, it's unrecognizable. Now this, this actually, this quote comes from Newsweek, which I can't believe uh, they would pass on this kind of misinformation because even liberal scholars know that the New Testament is a fairly accu- accurate document compared to what this is gonna say. Listen to this. No television preacher has ever read the Bible. Neither has any evangelical politician. And you get just, I mean, just with those two sentences, you can tell this person has an agenda. Uh, evangelists, or sorry, uh, televangelist, po- politician, like the, you can just tell from those two sentences, this is a liberal who hates the Bible. And um, neither has any evangelical politician, neither has the Pope, neither have I, and neither have you. At best, we've read a br- bad translation. And this is where it gets really inaccurate. A translation of translations of translations of hand copied copies of copies of copies of copies and on and on hundreds of times. So that would imply, this is, this is a total misconception people have about where the Bible came from. It's like you've got your, it's like 300 AD and you're, you're uh, copying the Bible. And then as soon as you make a copy, you take the old copy and you burn it and you translate it into a new language. And then a hundred years later, somebody else takes your old copy and they translate it into a new language and then they burn it. And every time the Bible's copied, the previous copy is burnt. If that were the case, then we would, you know, by 16, 18, 2000, we, would, we wouldn't really know what that original text said. And we might think we've never read it. It's just a translation of copies of translations of copies. But that is not the, the state of it at all. And so I've got a few pictures for you to just kind of tell you how, how uh, this works. And I mean, if you've ever read the, the beginning of your Bible, it actually has, like before you actually get into the text, it has a bunch of references to like what Greek manuscripts are used. And if you read like, I mean, depends on the Bible, but you'll see like LXX. And th- there's different... Um, abbreviations for different manuscripts, and then there's just different bodies of manuscripts, and nowadays they're taking like statistics, and they're like really getting specific about like which word right here, because there are some spots where there are a Greek word here or there where they're not sure which word was in the original text. And so it's true that we do not know every single word of the original, you know, letter of Romans by Paul. We do not have the original Uh, letter that Paul wrote. But what we have is we have copies of copies and copies and copies and copies. And so you've got 10,000 copies. I don't know if you've got that many, but you've got so many copies of the book of Romans that if you go backwards, you can kind of infer uh, down to like really small details. There are discrepancies where we don't know, did they say and or did they say but? Did they call God Lord or did they call God, God? Like there's little discrepancies like that. But in terms of like the majority of the text, there's a, there's a consensus of what's there. And so, and we have it in the original language that it was written in. And I'm talking about the New Testament, and so it's Greek. And so here's a picture of a, a codex, which is a complete copy of everything. And it's called the Codex Alexandrinus. And it dates to 400 AD. And so like, oh, that's, you know, three, 400 years after the thing was written. 
And, and, but that's the first time we have a f- complete copy of the entire um, Greek New Testament. Or actually, it's the second time. If you go back another hundred years, there's one more called the Codex Vaticanus, and that's from around 300 AD. And that's a complete copy of the New Testament. And then things start getting broken into pieces, and you get um, partials. And so you've got a partial chunk of the book of Matthew called Papyrus 64, and it dates somewhere to 150 to 200. And there's another papyrus, uh, papyrus, I'm just giving you some of the highlights. Papyrus 46 that dates somewhere between 175 to 225, and it's got several things from Paul in it, including Romans, Corinthians. Um, And then you get to the really small fragments, and you get really close to the origin of the actual document. So there's a fragment called uh, Papyrus 98 that's of the book of Revelation, and it's from dated to somewhere around 150 to 200. And then the, the youngest fragment they have is called Papyrus 52. It's called the John Rylands fragment. It's probably worth like a million dollars. You can actually get replicas of this thing and put them in your house. So my wife always likes to decorate the house with like, you know, dead flowers that are like not really flowers or like she's got this one spot where there's this like old broken glass window and I'm like thinking, I just saw the John Rylands fragment replicas, and I was like, oh, that would look good right next to that old glass broken window. Wouldn't that be cool to have like an exact replica of the earliest chunk of a manuscript of the New Testament that exists? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be cool. Um, so the John Rylands fragment, so the w- just so you know, like a little bit of how they date these things, they actually look at the way you draw letters, and over time, the way people would draw letters would change. And so like if your I has a little hook on it or if your N, you know, goes up to the top or only to the half and I don't know all the rules and there's a whole branch of nerdy, you know, history buffs who study these details, but based on this John Rylands fragment, based on the curvature of some of the letters and the way they put dots on things, they're dating it anywhere from 90 uh, to about 125. AD. And if the book of John was written around 90, I mean, you've got a fragment that is potentially within a 10 years of, of the original. And, and so that's super cool. I mean, it, I mean, I don't know if I don't know this stuff too well, but I mean, maybe that's actually even the original document and they just have a tiny fragment of the thing. But uh, that's super cool to find out. And in addition to that, you know, I wanted to tell you there's 5,700 Greek manuscripts. So, I mean, so many copies were made. Everybody, you know, can you imagine if there was no internet and the book of John showed up at your church? Everybody would go get their pen and make a copy who had the ability to write and had enough money for paper or papyrus, whatever that was. I think it's from a plant. And so... um, 5,700 Greek manuscripts exist today, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, 15,000 manuscripts in other languages. And so there's a ton of information for people to sort through to come up with, you know, what they think the original text of these books was. And some of them get very close, some of the fragments get very close to the original date. Now, just to give you a sense of like what all history is like, Caesar, same time period, there's a document called Caesar's Gaelic Wars, and it was written around 50 BC. Historians totally think they know what it said, but the first manuscript is from 850 AD, so 900 years later. But there's no doubt, like, among scholars, like, yeah, that's a historical document. Homer, you know, everybody's heard of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Homer wrote his stuff around 800 BC, the first manuscripts from 250 AD that the first manuscript that exists today, you know? But nobody doubts that Homer's Iliad and Odyssey say what they said. This is just the nature of history. Paper disappears, it it decays. And so um, you can't always have a a brand new copy of it. Now, another really strong evidence that the the stuff was transmitted reliably are these things called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so this little boy uh, was like taking his sheep out around the Dead Sea, uh, like I think around 50, 100 years ago, like 1950s, I think, and he's throwing rocks into caves, and he hears crash, he hears pottery break, and, he, and there's a cave by the Dead Sea where this guy's out with his sheep, this, this kid, and he goes up, and he finds these fragments of paper in these pots, and then, I don't know, somehow, 
If it was my kids, I'm sure they would have just destroyed it and lit it on fire. But this little kid somehow was smart enough to go tell somebody, hey, look what I found. And they found these things called the Dead Sea Scrolls that are dated from, I think, around 100 B.C. And so these Dead Sea Scrolls are the Old Testament. I think they're the Greek Old Testament. And um, they have been compared to the Old Testament we have today. Because if that evil Catholic church was changing the Bible to, to take the bad things out and change it and put good things in and control people, you would think they wouldn't just change the New Testament. They would also change the Old Testament. But you can take an Old Testament from before Jesus' time and you can compare it to a new, uh, an Old Testament today and it says the same thing. And so it appears historically there was no change made to the Old Testament by the Catholic Church. And so there's, that seems like pretty good reason to think the New Testament probably wasn't changed either. Um, so reliable transmission. As far as a, a normal historical document goes, the New Testament is the best historical document that exists from the time period from which it came. Okay, now early composition. Okay, how long have I been talking? 30, about 30 minutes? Okay. It's time to hit fast forward. All right, so I hope you haven't gone cross-eyed. This is really interesting, I'm telling you. Just stick with me. Um, okay, so we're gonna do the you had to be there principle. This is reason number three why uh, the New Testament is a reliable historical document. It gets details right that you had to be there to know. Okay, um, let's go Acts 28, 7. Now in the neighborhood of that place where the lands belonged to the chief, uh, there were lands that belonged to the chief man of the island named Publius, Publius, who received us and entertained us hospi hospitably for three days. So in America in, oh, here's a good example, Primeville. In Primeville, we have this guy in charge of our city. I don't know if he's exactly in charge of our city, but we have this guy, we call him the judge. And Seth Crawford does not have a law degree, as far as I understand. So he's not an actual judge, right? But we call him the judge because he's kind of the guy in charge of the whatever, I don't know. In the same way, over the course of history, when you go and you meet people who are in charge of different parts of a city, they have all kinds of names. And so... It happened to be in the island of Malta when uh, Paul and Barnabas shipwrecked there. You know, this, I, I think of Malta as kind of this place with almost savages back then. It was this island in the Mediterranean. And they shipwrecked there, and they get taken to the chief man of the island. And doesn't that just cho totally sound like what you would call, like, the head of, like, sort of indigenous people? The chief man of the island. But he was, he was somehow Roman. But um, this term, the chief man of the island, you know, you read that in the New Testament, you just kind of gla graze right over that. But they found an inscription on Malta that's, that calls this guy by name Publius or Publius, and it gives him this title, the chief man of the island, and it's sort of like calling him the governor. And so to get that little detail right, I mean, if you're writing the book of Acts 100, 200 years later, you're going to really struggle to know that. But they get it right. Um, in Acts 13, 6, now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a, fo uh, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulius, an intelligent man. Now, I've actually got a picture of this. They found an inscription of Sergius Paulus's name, uh, and uh, they know that the, the term proconsul was the right term for this guy. And there were other terms at the time for very similar roles, depending on how you were governed. But once again, the New Testament gets it right in the book of Acts. Uh, and I'm just going through the book of Acts right now. Um, Acts 21, 28. Uh, Men of Israel, help us. This man who preaches against our people everywhere. This is the Jews talking about Paul. Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defiles this holy place, bringing in Gentiles. And then they want to kill Paul for this. Well, they found this thing called a temple warning inscription. And it, it existed in this uh, spot right before you go into this court around the temple. And it said, this is what it said. I mean, you can see the picture, but it's in another language, so I'll translate it for you. No Gentile may enter beyond the dividing wall into the court and around the holy place. Whoever is caught will be put to blame for his subsequent death. And so 
just as the Bible says, this gives a little context that if Paul were to have brought, you know, um, a Gentile like Timothy in to this spot, they would have killed him for it. And we find, you know, that that rule existed and it's even written on a rock somewhere that we can still see today. And so these little details about what was going on at the time, as you study the archaeology and the history of the book of Acts, you, you get more insight. You understand what's going on because it seems to have been written in that time period and all the details seem to match up. Now, uh, for this reason, you know, and I'm going through the book of Acts, I'd like to talk briefly about the date for the book of Acts. So I mentioned, you know, we found that John Ryland's fragment for the book of John, 90 AD, and it was, it was pretty close to that. So another, there's another argument, which is called the argument from silence, which isn't the strongest argument you can make because an argument from silence is not known as like, oh, that's rock solid. But it's really interesting how the book of Acts ends. Uh, there was a major event in 70 AD where this wonderful temple that had existed for a long time was destroyed by the Romans. And there was, in, in the 60s, Nero was raised up as a leader and he started persecuting Christians heavily. And, um, and then they eventually destroyed the temple of the Jews. And so there were some major events in the 60s and in 70. Also, Paul dies, uh, they think, at, uh, in 64 AD. James died in 61 AD. Peter died in 66 AD. And so Nero, Paul's death, James's death, Peter's death, the destruction of the temple, none of these things are recorded in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts ends with Paul in prison, still alive. And so there's, that's a pretty strong argument that the book of Acts may have been written in the 50s, which is just tw- you know 20 years after 33 AD, 20 years after Jesus. And then the book of Acts came after the book of Luke, and most scholars think Luke was Luke and Matthew probably used an earlier source um, to write their gospels. And most scholars think Mark was the earliest book. Now, just to give you a sense of kind of the evidence and how it has affected the views of scholars, there was a guy, uh, I don't know if he's still alive today, but in in the 50s, he wrote a book called uh, Honest to God. And it expressed fashionable skepticism of the time. So it's been a very fashionable thing for the last hundred years to be skeptical that the New Testament is, is historically, um, you know, correct or, or, you know, just, um, you know, written as early as young or, or as early as like, you know, evangelicals would think. And so this guy, John A.T. Robinson, he's a, he's a liberal uh, bishop of some kind, and he wrote this book, Honest to God, and he was a scholar. And he just expressed that sort of fashionable view that, you know, oh, yeah, it's probably written 100 and 150 A.D. Uh, Well, later in his career, he actually changed his view because in the last 40 years, things have actually been going the other direction. And scholars have actually been starting to say, hey, this seems to be like maybe this was earlier than we thought. And um, so he actually changed his view, and he now believes or Uh, from the source I have, I don't know how long ago this was, he believed um, that the book of Mark was maybe written just 40 to 44 AD because if you you put Acts before um, the death of Paul and then you put Luke before Acts and then you put Mark before Luke, you can get to where these things were written super early. There's also just little chunks of text like in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about this this, uh, the gospel, basically, and he quotes the gospel, there's chunks of text that they've dated, you know, evangelical scholars have dated to maybe as early as like 35, 37 AD. Just little little uh, sort of repeatable things like, uh, what do we call that? I don't know, but you know. Okay, so anyway, uh, there's a lot of evidence that the New Testament was written very uh, recent to when it happened. And how much time have I been talking? 30, I got, I got 15? All right, I got 15. Okay, it's not my fault. It was Jordan Avery. He said I could. All right. Uh, so last thing I'm going to go over, so I've, just to give you kind of a recap, uh, the New Testament's written in a documentary style. It appears to have reliable transmission. Uh, it has an early composition. Last reason to trust the New Testament as a historical document is external corroboration which basically means like, hey, there's some external proof that this seems to be true. And I've kind of mentioned a few of those things already, like stones they found and stuff, name people. 
But uh, let's look at a few. Let's, so like the book of John is probably the most uh, criticized gospel because it has just, it, it's, it's, everybody thinks it was written the latest and it has just sort of like extensive differences between some of the other gospels. And, and so if, if somebody was going to say, hey, you know, the gospel of John, like if somebody was going to say, hey, which book of the Bible or which gospel was the least accurate, you might say, hey, John, because it seems to have been written the latest and it doesn't match up with some of the details of some of the others. Um, so let's look at all the things in John. Like if you, ha- if you talk to a really liberal thinker on this, it's like, oh, John, it's like, it's just totally like just rainbows and sunshine, no, no accuracy there. But, it, you know, it's funny to look at John and look at all the historically accurate things that are in it. And so... Uh, John 2, 6, okay, it says, Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. You know, we read stories in the Bible, and we just don't really notice these sorts of details. Like this, I, I put this in to like put this verse in, and it kept changing it to 1 John 2, 6, because John 2, 6 is the most boring informational verse in the book of John, maybe. Six stone water jars, each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. I mean, it's like reading a lab report. Um, But, I mean, it's interesting. Those details are in there too. It's not just Jesus did this miraculous thing and changed wine into water. This is at the wedding where Jesus changed water into wine. I think I said that backwards. Um, So the the interesting to notice here is it says the, the, the things used for water were not clay, they were stone. Now, if I was alive in 100 AD or 50 AD, and I was going to make a pot, I would use clay because you can mold clay. But this says they were made of stone. That would be a heck of a lot harder. You'd have to like chip out the stone. It would take you months. And the, they think the reason that they used these was because there, there was a hygienic you know, reason. So maybe bacteria grow on clay better than they grow on rock. But they have found... Uh, these stone water pots all over the place in Galilee, and stone, unlike paper that, you know, we don't have as many manuscripts, stone doesn't go away very quickly. And so they've set, found lots of these stone water jars. And so, once again, you had to be there to know they were using stone and not clay, and, and it's found in the place at the right time. Uh, okay, John 4, 5, and 6, uh, this is Jesus coming up to the well and uh, uh, talking to the woman at the well, you know, uh, and eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sy- Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son. I have read this story so many times and never thought about the well. I always think about Jesus. I always think about the woman at the well, how he's going to sh- evangelize with her. That's what we tend to focus on. But it gives us some specific information. Jacob's well was there, and it was in Samaria. Uh, and, uh, yep, okay, so there is a church built. And now if you're going to build a church, like I could totally see myself becoming one of those people who's like, you know, this was Jesus' cell phone. Like Jesus didn't have a cell phone, but if he did, I would want to keep it. You know, it's just like a normal human instinct to want like a souvenir and to want like Jesus touched this dirt, put that dirt in a bowl and keep it. And so like, here's this well, they called it Jacob's well. And somebody built a church in three, around 300 AD. Somebody built a church over this well in Samaria that dates to about that time period. And, and so, you know, we don't know for sure if that was Jacob's well, but there's a well in the right place. And somebody built a church over it, which probably took a lot of money, you know, 1,700 years ago. Okay, uh, I think I've got one more, and I'm going to go a little faster. Now, this, this one's really cool. Inside the city, this is John chapter 5, when Jesus heals uh, the guy who can't get into the pool to get healed. And it says, inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. John was not just rainbows and sunshine. He, He didn't just tell us, yeah, there was this pool somewhere and Jesus showed up and healed the guy. He tells us where it was, what it was next to, and he tells us that it had five covered porches over it. And once again, they found this. And it even has the five porches. And so, once again, a historical thing that is verified um, by archaeology. John 6, there's a synagogue mentioned. They found a synagogue, and it dated wrong. And here's the thing. Not every single detail of the Bible has been like shown with archaeology. 
Sometimes they don't know what's going on. They, they found a synagogue in, uh, I want to say it's, I can't remember where it was. I didn't write it in my notes. But they found a synagogue uh, to match the synagogue in John 6. Oh, but they, then they dated it, and it's like 400 AD. But then they dug it up and went deeper, and there was another floor from another synagogue below that, and that one dated to the first century. Uh, John 9, 6, and 7, this thing called the Pool of Siloam. They found it in the right place with the right date on it uh, based on how they did it. I don't know how they did it. Uh, Lazarus's tomb, uh, it talks about there being a cave and a stone over it. And there's a, there's a tradition that there's a spot where they think this is. And John 11, oh, that was John 11. Okay, now, now let's get into Jesus. Like, here's another historical detail. You've probably heard about this one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go from two places here, John 24 and 5, and then Matthew 27, uh, 59 and 60. So in John, John 24 and 5, uh, this is Peter and John running after Mary tells them that Jesus was um, risen. And they, they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. He didn't go in because it was like you were going to become unclean if you went in. But Peter shows up and he just goes right in. Uh, but it says here, he stooped and looked in. And they, they have found lots of tombs in this area. There's one in particular called the Garden Tomb that I know that Rory has been to it, and he thinks it's the spot. And there's even a spot where they've like etched out a little extra room for some guy who wasn't supposed to be buried there. Um, but this is the way the tombs work. You have to stoop in to get inside of them. There's a big rock that rolls in front of them. All these details match up. And then... Uh, you know, it says he placed uh, Jesus, this is in Matthew 27, 59 and 60, he placed uh, Jesus in his own tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. This is another thing. These tombs were carved out of the rock. Uh, and then there's a great stone to roll in front of it. And so once again, we have, you know, historical details that match up with what exists at that time. Um, I could go on. Those were all places that are external corroboration. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep going because I don't want to kill you, but um, you could, you could also look at people. One, one thing that's really cool to look at is uh, Pilate. There's, for a long time, they didn't think there was any evidence Pilate was a real person, and then they found an, uh, an engraving that showed Pilate. Oh, yeah, he was. He was exactly what the Bible said he was. There's another one. So Pilate was maybe a little more famous. There's another one for this guy named Erastus. Now, I just learned about this this week, and it's in Romans 16.23. I don't have this in there, but it says Erastus uh, is the director of public works in Corinth. And he's, I think when Paul wrote to the Romans, he's writing from Corinth, and so he includes that Erastus is with him. Well, they found an engraving that describes Erastus and this, that this was his job title. And he's just a nobody, you know, director of public works. I mean, be like Dwayne Garner. Like, oh, yeah, here's this carving with Dwayne Garner's name on it, you know, we found in Prineville, Oregon. Like, most people aren't going to know he exists, you know? And same thing with Erastus. Um, I got I to gotta stop talking. Okay, one more really cool thing. Just in the last, like, 20 years, they found this thing called an ossuary. And an ossuary is a bone box. And this was only a practice right around 0 to 100 AD. And what they would do is they bury people in the ground. They'd let them rot. And then they'd dig up their bones after the flesh was gone. They'd put them in a box, and they'd write some nice things on this box and hide it somewhere. Well, they found this ossuary... Like, I think it was when I was in college, and it says on it, and I didn't get a picture of this, but you could look it up. You could look for uh, James Ossuary. So it says on it, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And they've dated this stuff on the ossuary. I forget what the name of it is. It's just basically like dirt. And they can date the dirt on the carving. So they see when it was carved, and then whatever's on top of the carving you know, is younger than the carving. And they've dated the dirt on the carving, and they found it to be a first century box, and it's in Jerusalem. And so there were only 60,000 people living in Jerusalem uh, at that time period, and only people who were rich or who had, like, fame got their bones put into boxes. You know, it's a very high privilege to have your bones put in a box. And so the fact that they found this, and it's some guy named James who has a dad named Joseph, and then it was very rare to put anything on it besides who his father was. So they, the only reason they would put on, like, brother of Jesus was because this Jesus guy had some reputation as well. And so James, one of the leaders of the early church, the brother of Jesus, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And it's all there on this box. It's really interesting. Um, you could look into it. 
All right, so, wow, thanks for that uh, download of information, Johnny. Now that I'm cross-eyed, sorry, it, it'll, it'll just go back. Give it a couple minutes. Um, that actually happens to me sometimes when I go running. Like, one of my, I don't know what's wrong with me. I mean, there's a lot of things wrong with me. But sometimes I go running, and, and sometimes it'll happen when I'm playing tennis, too. Something about exercise. Every once in a while, one of my eyes will just, and, I, and then I'm just like, ah! And if you try to open both your eyes while your eyes are cross-eyed, it's just, it's, oh, man. And then I just rub it for a while, usually, and then it goes back to normal. I haven't told my doctor about that. Maybe I should. <laughs> it's really an interesting sensation. <laughs> it's, it's gone on for like 10 years. Okay. Sometimes it's happening, and somebody's like talking to me, and I'm like trying to pretend like it's, oh, yeah, I just got something in my eye. Okay, sorry. Distracted. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of evidence, you know, and a lot of reasons to trust the New Testament. And if you've ever spoken with somebody and they just act like the Bible's just a joke, I mean, the, the joke is them. They don't know the history. But at the same time, there's an there's a important place for humility because there are things that are uncertain. And so I'm going to give you like one example of this. Peter was um, a fisherman. And he uh, was kind of a nobody. And, you know, it would be like... Even just 100 years ago, a guy in Primeville who's a logger, you know, he, I don't know that he would even know how to read and write. And, and so there's no uh, strong reason to think Peter was this, like, really amazing academic guy. Like, we know Paul was super academic, but Peter seemed like kind of a, kind of a, just a Joe Schmo. And um, the, the Greek language that First and Second Peter are written with are pretty good. Like, they're pretty high quality, somebody who knew their stuff. And so one, um, you know, skepticism that's currently out there about the Bible is they, they think that, you know, and this, this depends on your worldview, and it depends who you want to trust, and, and it depends who your allegiance is to. If you want to devote yourself to the consensus of liberal scholarship, if you want to devote yourself to the consensus of the secular world, then you would probably uh, fit in well to say, I don't think Peter wrote First and Second Peter. Um, because, you know, a fisherman probably didn't write this really eloquent Greek. Um, and I, I haven't studied this extensively. I've listened to a couple debates about it. There's this great radio station I listen to called Unbelievable Christian Radio. It's this British guy. And he gets people together, and it's not an argument. It's not like, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. It's two scholarly people, and they sit down, and they talk for like an hour and a half. And they just talk about it. They talk about why they think what they think. And this guy in the middle, just, he's a Christian, and he just kind of lets them talk. And um, so I've listened to some guys on this, and, and it's an interesting debate. But like ultimately, like... I, I don't worry about this kind of stuff anymore. Like when I was a young Christian, when I would, if I would have heard that, like, oh, Peter was dumb, but his letters are written in really good Greek. Like, oh, the, the Bible's totally fake. I'm doomed. You know, that was kind of like as a young Christian, that's kind of how I acted sometimes in my mind. Um, but I've gotten to a place. Now, first off, I mean, I, I really haven't spent much time on this one, but uh, I personally don't have any problem with the idea that Peter had something like a secretary. So if Peter's a, a missionary, and he's going, he's a, he's a fisherman, an untrained fisherman, and he speaks, I think they spoke Aramaic mostly, and he's going to the Greek world as a missionary, he's probably going to bring some help. You know, if Rory Rogers is an American who speaks country boy English, and he goes to Nepal, he's not going to be able to speak to them in country boy English, so he gets a translator that goes with him. So it's very possible Peter had a translator with him, or, you know, who knows what kind of close friend he had who was extremely well-trained in Greek, and maybe it was more like a conversation, and this guy, um, you know, wrote the letter for him as he told him what he wanted. I don't know, and that's just one idea I have, you know, uh, and, but here's the thing, you don't even have to be devoted to naturalism. Maybe God, like, supernaturally uh, empowered Peter to become a ridiculous Greek uh, user of the Greek by his spirit, you know, but, I mean, you say that in, like, a secular you know, intellectual discourse about, uh, oh, God. you know, because naturalism so permeates our culture. Everything has to be natural all the time. God's not allowed to intervene. We have to be allowed to figure this out on our own without him, you know? And so I've kind of gotten to a point that, like, literally, I mean, how old am I? I'm like 36. This is like 
14, 16 years ago, I got to this point where I realized, like, you know, you have two options. You, are, you either pledge your allegiance to the secular, uh, naturalistic scholars of the world, and you say, whatever they can figure out is what I believe. Or you pre- pledge your allegiance to Jesus, and you say, you know, I don't know why Peter's written in this beautiful Greek, but Peter's an average Joe. But I just trust Jesus. You know, I have heard the message of Jesus. This book is not some fairy tale just put together by a guy like Joseph Smith. You know, there's lots of reasonable uh, things about it. But there are still these things sometimes that are like, I don't know what the answer is to that. But my devotion is not to knowing everything through secular humanist methods. My devotion is to Jesus. And I trust that he put this book together the right way. And I trust that it's inspired by him. I, it's, not, it's not a provable thing that the Bible is this inerrant, inspired book. It's an assumption. And everybody, what they believe, they start with an assumption, and they go from there. If your assumption is naturalism, humanism, secular authority, then yeah, you're probably going to you know, pick and choose what you like in the Bible. But if your authority is Jesus Christ, then you're going to say, I trust him. He treated the Old Testament like every word was inspired. So I treat it like that too, and I treat the New Testament the same way. And, you know, I want to read 1 Corinthians one twenty one. I forgot to get this for you, but you might be able to get it in there. Um, and this is why, this is why. You cannot serve both, and this is what I try to do as a young Christian. I tried to serve both those masters. I wanted to use secular humanism and, and secular authorities, but also be devoted to Jesus and somehow put them all together and get this perfect easy, provable thing. And that's just not realistic. And, and that's not God's method. And so let's look at 1 Corinthians uh, one twenty one. It says, "For si- I mean, you read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. But it says, this is kind of like the thesis of it. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. And I mean, I could, I could just go off on that whole passage right now, but like God is not impressed by what you can figure out on your own. God is not, I mean, he, he certainly allows us to be intelligent, reasonable people who find evidence to support, you know, what we believe. But ultimately, God does not call you to come to him through academics. God calls you to come to him through faith. And and God did it this way to shame the wise. I mean, it talks more about this in here in chapter one. God is not looking for people to figure him out. God has told us who he is, and he wants us to believe what he says. And so that is in, that is in contradiction with the way the world likes to know things. And I don't think God's completely against reason or anything like that. That's why I just spent all this time showing you all this evidence. But ultimately, you have to choose to trust God when there are difficulties you don't understand. And you have to want that. And that's a work of his Holy Spirit inside of you. So um, I, don't, I don't really feel like this is a gospel presentation kind of Sunday, but this is a, you know, put your faith in God in the details that we haven't figured out yet. And, and serve God, don't serve the world. I mean, this is usually the, usually the message of don't serve the world is about like material possessions, right? But I think there's also a place, don't serve the world that like the world gets to tell you every detail of your worldview. The world does not set up your worldview. The Bible sets up your worldview. This needs to be your foundation um, as a Christian. If you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to be like him. He believed that the world, the, the word of God was inspired every jot and tittle and so, give God your devotion, and when you get to those, those areas where you struggle with doubt, if, if you're a person who struggles with that, bring it to God, trust him to make sense of it for you, and sometimes you might wait for answers your whole life, but, you know, by and large, we can trust this book, and it's very reliable. So, um, I really enjoy that kind of stuff. I hope I, I know some of you might have just bored out of your mind for 45 minutes. Hopefully, it was 45 minutes. Uh-oh, I think it was 55 minutes. Okay. Love you guys. Uh, are you guys doing the last song? Yes. No. All right. No? Get your butt up here, Clay.
we run a very tight ship around here when Rory's gone. I'm going to put the hat back on. Oh, wait, I threw it away. Okay, uh, I'm going to pray while the worship team gets into their spot. God, um, we just thank you for your word. Thank you that it is uh, historically accurate. And that, God, thank you for like all the men throughout human history, throughout Christian history, who have worked hard to preserve um, every character of the New Testament in Greek and who have um, documented historical evidences and, you know, saved the writings of Josephus and, and uh, even just the last hundred years, Christians are doing a great job of, like, getting information out about archaeology. And so, God, just thank you that, that we have nothing to fear, that we can use our minds to engage in this and, and be confident. But also, God, we just want to be Christians who do not submit to the world, who do not just do everything the, world, the way the world does, but God, we are different, and we submit to you, and we devote ourselves to you, our allegiance is to you, God, and whether it's in our finances, and our, in our, you know, purchases, and in our uh, um, possessions, and things that we love, in that sense, but also, God, even in our um, intellectual devotion, God, we want to be devoted to you and not have idols before you. And so, God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.